Okay, I'm back. So now I will wait for everyone. Wait, are you live? Yes, I'm live again, just now. There were people there before. And wait, don't close, don't do anything. So they were at my Janix account before. Okay, I'm still on Janelle Luke, I never changed. But I have to wait right now for everyone to come back on. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. Well, I'm keep on preparing my lecture. Okay. okay. Oh, some patients are back. Yay. Sorry, guys. Like I said, it would take me one more time. I think by next week, Dr. Luke will get it. Uh, wait. I'm gonna wait a little bit. Hi guys. And now, um, how do I know? Can you type like the number of people on now? So I know, uh, Sharon. Oh my God, Bonnie, Bonnie from my old life in Hong Kong. Fantastic. Hi. This is great, guys. See, I never know. Facebook can connect me with people from all walks, all part of my life from the history. It's crazy. Great. Um, so... How are you? Today is the second part of Diminished Ovarian Reserve. Um, I have some very exciting things for next week, but let's talk about Diminished Ovarian Reserve. And basically today we're going to do it. I, I'm trying to keep my Facebook Live as short as possible. So then last time we, it was an hour for Diminished Ovarian Reserve. So um, this time I'm going to try to keep it a little bit shorter, a little bit like pinpoint what needs to be talked about. And then um, you. Tell me what to, you know, what some suggestions for some coming weeks or coming time. So diminished ovarian reserve, we last week talked about is number of ovaries, number of eggs inside your ovary. And FSH can go higher and higher and because the FSH is telling the ovary to produce an egg. Um, I drew some different numbers. Mm, maybe not as good. It's hard to see, right? The number is hard to see. Yes, very no. I will find another way next time. Uh, this is a learning point for me. Um, so we are basically is um, going to talk about is what kind of FSH level and what when what kind of protocol and treatment for certain kind of FSH level. So we have patients who may have FSH level that are like 25 or 20. With that kind of FSH level, we usually will not able to use any medications already because it is so high, the FSH is, is in a certain level, um, no matter what you do, uh, the, let's say I give more FSH or, or it stimulate, I'm not gonna get more eggs. And when the FSH is 25, usually the number of eggs is ranging between one, two, or three. Is it a cycle to give up? Oh my God, and many places, uh, many patients will tell me, Dr. Luke, 
my uh, my uh, IVF center is not able to do a cycle because my FSH is over 15. So my one of my highest FSH baby to embryo um, was actually in the 30s. Um, and I think in the long, long time ago, even in the 50s, and that egg was the baby. So I don't usually cancel cycles, but I will prepare patients that if your FSH level is so high in the 20 or 50, sometime your FSH is not able to, um, to stimulate. Your ovary just cannot respond. Hi, guys. Um, and so the FSH level can be a problem. Uh, if it is too high, it's nothing we can do. It's just that your body at that moment, the ovary, like the ovarian whisper, when it's higher than 25, you know the ovary may not able to produce an egg in a timely fashion, but does not mean you will not produce an egg. So that's a two different uh, way of talking. So it's be very uh, careful when you understand, can you stimulate an ovary? What is your day three FSH level? And usually I look at also your estrogen level. Estrogen level usually is a little bit low. Um, FSH is, um, we usually like estrogen level to be less than 50. What that means is that the, there's no follicles are developing. Everyone is small follicles when the, the estrogen is less than 50. The FSH level is just telling how many eggs that month will be and how prepared your body is. In a normal patient, excuse me, I shouldn't say normal. Everyone here is normal. What I meant is in a younger patient, maybe the FSH level is a little bit better and healthier, then the FSH level usually is less than 10, less than 10. And estrogen at the beginning of the cycle is usually less than 50. And those numbers, when I see it, I can't know the patients may have more than one or two or three eggs even, um, and they were able to be stimulated. So the FSH and estrogen are very important indicator for me as a physician to understand how much medication can this patient ovaries take. It's not 100%. I do miss about 10% where even though the FSH and the estrogen level looks beautiful, like looks like a normal, but they cannot, um, they were not able to um, produce more than one or two eggs. So everyone have a very interesting view of the FSH and the, ox, um, the estrogen level. So my job is to take a look at the fall ovary. Do you remember I told you like learning about weather? Um, when there's a sunlight outside, when there's a um, temperature is great, uh, when the feeling is good, but this, you get all the data about certain things uh, does not mean it is a accurate, absolute accurate presentation of everything. So it is important to understand um, when you look at ovary, you have to look at it from different factors. Um, how short, how long was your cycle? How high is your FSH in the last couple of months? What does the ovary look like on ultrasound? And then all this factor will go through a doctor's experience or mind, I wish there's a program for it. Not yet, there's no computer program for it. Um, and then you will synthesize a protocol for the patient. Um, I'm sorry this didn't work. I wrote kind of different situation um, oh here of what FSH level will be like. Uh, can you guys see it? I gave you some scenario of FSH level um, and scenarios of hormones. It may some of you may able to see it, some of you may okay. Uh, so this one right here is a underneath my hand is FSH of seven. I'm sorry, 13, estrogen of seven, and LH of three. Now, um, seven is a very low estrogen. And some of these are from, um, from patients from before that I got the history of the blood work. And the FSH is 13 right there. But we'll pull back a little bit. Okay, let me see. Let's see. Pull back. Do you see that? Better? Can see it? So I can copy some of the scenarios and how I think. And so these are some of the examples. So this is the FSH of 13. Um, and then the estrogen of 7. LH of 5, progesterone less than 1. For, for liquid phase, usually ooh, progesterone is less than 1. That means you are not ovulating. LH and all these are very good numbers. Um, LH, this is 3. Usually it should be less than 10. And then the FSH is about 13. We like this less than 10. So when the FSH is 13, we're a little bit worried. Oh, oh, 
um, is it a little bit high in terms of the levels? And for this patient's protocol or visualization, even I don't have the ultrasound for that day, I would expect to see sometimes ranging between three to six particles for this patient. On ultrasound, if you only see one, it can also happen that this patient only get one. So the ultrasound is more a very good calculation of what I'm seeing now. Oh, it is an art with ultrasound. I get a patient with AMH of 0 0.02. Now I don't want to confuse you. When I get a patient doing ultrasound elsewhere, when I'm not doing the scan, sometimes I will get this scan and this, and you can ask my clinical assistant or nurses, uh, they have eight follicles. Oh, eight follicles when her AMH is 0 0.05. So why are the sonographer giving, you, giving me a wrong answer? It's not wrong. They're basically looking at follicles that should not have been counted. So I know this sounds a little bit confusing for you guys. What that means, Dr. Lu, you drew circles on your ovary last week. And it's, to me, that's a very clear, right? All the circles, isn't that clear? That like one, two, three, four, five, there's five follicles. Why are you saying that it's hard to see? Well, because sometimes certain follicles, they are very uh, small. There's something called premortal follicles. They're one to two millimeter. Uh, that's called preantral follicles. And there's antral follicles. So in a very high definition, we have one of the most advanced ultrasound in our office, not the old style one. This is a, I think it's a B7 Volusion GE ultrasound. You can see a lot of things. And sometimes um, it is very hard to, um, to get the, uh, to get, to, to know are those are real follicles. And this is where experience and integrating patient history when you do a scan is so important. Um, and so when I train my sonographer or I train my fellows or uh, even myself when I'm scanning and when I'm reading ultrasound report, I really take note where did they get the ultrasound? How did the peer person see the, look at the ultrasound? What is a follicle that's going to respond and what follicle is not? So patients sometimes get confused. Hey, you told me I have eight. Well, AMH of 0 0.1 and the FSH of 13, let's say that same number that I just showed you. Hmm, I don't think I would ever, I would not get an eight follicles, uh, li unlikely, okay? Then never ever, and then my professor always say, Janelle, never say ever, never, uh, because the science, like COVID-19, <laughs> who would guess something like this can happen? Uh, but it can. So life is, always give me some curveball, but my guidance to all my patients is usually based on 90 or 90% 90 of the evidence and 90% of possibility, and that's why we are doing this talk. So um, that was one scenario of the blood work that I'm showing, uh, where a patient may have two, three, even six follicles with that kind of blood work. It, with, again, if you have a part two, um, if you have a, excuse me, if you have a antrophalical count that's similar to that, then I will say that. But if your antrophalical count is only one or two, guess what? That day two blood work that you just saw right now, actually the FSH will go high. And that in about a couple of days, you will see the FSH. Sometimes the blood work does not come at the same time as the ultrasound result. So the ultrasound is showing one or two and the FSH is a little bit lower, not 25, but actually lower, which at 13, still high compared to the normal patient, but 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 still lower for patients who are like 25 FSH with one egg or perimenopause. Then I will predict this patient FSH will keep on going higher, and that prediction has been doing very well because intrafollicular count usually don't suddenly change. So if I see that count um, is very low at the beginning that actually trumps some of this blood work for that month, okay? So antrophalical count only good for that month. Um, hi guys, hi everyone. I, am I too confusing? So I'm gonna show you one more blood work and, and really this empowerment session and using COVID-19 and on a weekday that I can get to talk to you guys is really to gauge and guide you how I have been doing um, natural cycle or mild stimulation cycle and what are the ideas of doing it and why I'm doing it and not every doctor. Uh, the secret actually is very difficult to do a mild and natural cycle. 
because you're reading the ovary at every moment and nature can change today can be cold tomorrow can be very warm um and that's why reading and blood work becomes crucial um but then not everyone is um someone that is uh, a candidate for mild or natural um and i will give you some samples of my patient where natural has to be done without that they would not have got pregnant um is natural or mild better uh this is a big controversy and the more papers needs to come out there's some randomized uh, control trial came out a long time ago that shows actually conventional cycles if you're younger it's still better than mild uh but if you're but they haven't uh, for the patient with diminished ovarian reserve or who are older who had a bad uh fail multiple fail history um they're the same but with mild stimulation uh saving having more cost effectiveness interesting huh uh, means that they may not one may not be better than the other so this is the second paper which is pretty well done it was done by dr silver um in colorado and he uh and basically look at all the uh 38 year old and older and his cost analysis is that the mild stimulation obviously uh use less mats less cost um and has demonstrated they save more money but doesn't mean it's better but at the same time it's about the same so why not so we think saving money wins right because you don't use that much medication um mild and natural stimulation are also great when the enteropoietal count, count is very low like i explained before if your fsh um now i'm going to show you another fsh level this one let me see if you can see it mm -hmm. Okay, can you see that? This one is a very uh, a little bit extreme FSH level. Um, the FSH is at 15, estrogen at 25, LH is 5. Oh, sorry, maybe. Oh, 30, sorry, 30 is FSH. My seem to say. Oh, so sorry. This one, this one. LH is, FSH is 30, um, estrogen is 5, LH is 20, and it progesterone is 0.2. Now, this was what I was like, describing that I may not. Uh, see too much eggs in this patient. And I would not give medication in a scenario with this patient, uh, especially with anthropological count, let's say one or two. Uh, this is not a very good uh, result because we can see the estrogen. And by the way, this is all from, uh, again, previous of my patient blood work, and I just have talked about it, the thinking behind it and the understanding. Um, this is FSH is 30, uh, estrogen is 5. LH is 20 and the progesterone 0.2. So with this kind of patient, uh, I the more FSH I give um, is not going to do anything. Either we cancel the cycle or we follow. But I said I would I don't want to cancel because I have PP from FSH over 30. So I'm not going to cancel. I would tell the patient they have sex or we'll follow through with you. Without COVID, obviously I'll follow with her, check her um follicle count, maybe one or two. And this is very interesting phenomenon. When the FSH is 30 and the estrogen is not really have any response, this patient may not form the follicle at the beginning. She may form the follicle actually on day 19 or day 20. And do you see the LH here a little bit? And this is where why some other scientists say, I don't want to do the cycle. What if this becomes a cyst? Because this is a hormone. LH is a hormone that makes you off. But at the beginning of her cycle, her LH is already high. So some of this patient, I may even need to give a birth control pill to steady up the cycle. Because the higher the uh, follicle exposed to the LH, sometimes it will be turning into a cyst. And it's also a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with your patient. Even though I have a patient with FSH 30 and still have an H2 baby, but does not mean everyone will have an H2 baby, right? I'm not going to give up. It's not zero. It's not definitely, it's not all everyone will have an H2 baby. Uh, but if I have 10%, I want it. Don't you want it with FSH? Because how many times is she's going to cycle? Like that's also another uh, possibility that I have to tell patient because FSH is 30 means she may start to skip cycles the next year or the following year. So with all this said, my job is to really uh, understand her kind of uh, understand her cycle, understand her rationale going through or not going through at this moment, and also to explain to patient, hey. We may not have anything for one week. You may have to wait till the third week or you know later on because the FSH is so high. And yes, I definitely would not give you injections. I ask you to buy a thousand dollar pen to inject yourself to stimulate to get more eggs. There's not more. We either we get one or two. 
Um, and and actually, surprisingly, sometimes the FSH will, will shut down the ovary naturally because the FSH is so high. Day seven, day eight, the estrogen will grow, huh? Because the ovaries still have to have what granulosa cell, like we talked about in the last session. That's FSH receptor. So the estrogen, there's some ovary, the follicle wants to grow. It's something in the body wants to grow it, and so the estrogen will go higher, and that will suppress the FSH. So then in the middle of the cycle, I have a patient, and some of my patient, I think it was last month, she she came and say, Dr. Luke, this sucks, my cycle. I said, well, wait, wait, wait. And then right when we go, when, when like two weeks later, she has a three follicle development. And I was I surprised? No, because this is what we will see when patients are having diminished ovarian reserve. The ovary is not doing the trajectory the way uh, most people are doing in terms of um, the way we were younger and when we were in 20, 25, uh, or, or if it's not age, when the ovary, you know, 10 years ago is a little bit different. So that's why majority of us are dealing with fertility. A majority of you are looking for me is when the cycle is not yet regular and starting to deteriorate the ovary. And that's why we are here. Um, looking at all this, um, uh, FSH, I'm going to do a couple of FSH estrogen exercise. I thought it was fun. I don't know if it's fun. Give me some feedback um, privately or publicly, wherever. I, I'm tough skin. I can take some feedback. Um, and I will try to get music next time. Uh, and uh, I am very, you know, today I'm going to start to wrap up the session. I see my, oh, we don't have as much questions as last two sessions. Um, we are going to have a Fertility, actually it's not me, the nation is having a nation in fertility awareness week, NIAW, for next week. So we are trying to have some posts or education each day. Um, right now, I think 1 p.m. is the best. So I'm going to try to keep all my Facebook at 1 p.m. We're testing different hours, like today, we want more participants. I think 1 p.m. from Tuesday and Thursday, I will keep that. And I guess what, guys? Dr. Nate that may be starting next week, um, and, um, and he will be doing it on Friday, I think. He's not Mickey certain yet, but I, his debut coming out uh, to give his first, uh, I think he's going to do Instagram. He likes Instagram. Hi, guys. Uh, he would like to do Instagram. So Dr. Nate, first time, he will be doing Instagram next week. And me, because I haven't confirmed yet, but I'm trying to get a guest. It's a patient of mine. A uh, long, long time ago, become a friend, um, and she has a personal story to share. She wrote a book, uh, and and she's a great writer. Um, and I will be announcing that also in your listserv and Instagram and Facebook, um, and try to be creative uh, because we are, um, you know, trying to you know get accustomed to all these things that are happening, and I can't wait. Uh, to hopefully COVID-19 and see you guys in person. Uh, but during this time, I discovered something new, Facebook Live. I even connect patients from, I mean, not patients, but friends from Hong Kong, uh, from my past. So I'm looking forward to see you next week. Uh, and uh, the topics, is, the topic that I'm inviting my patient or friend or colleague who is coming in, uh, she's no longer my patient anymore, but as a colleague, I guess, as a friend, uh, we're really talking about is how to deal with multiple failures. Um, you guys are not easy. Most of what majority of you guys come to me um, uh, has been really uh, coming from many other centers. I'm sometimes your third or your second uh, IVF doctor. Um, I have been, I have a baby that was named after me. That patient actually, <laughs> I was her 11th or 10th IVF doctor. Uh, is also on my podcast, which hasn't been there because I haven't had time to cut the script. But hopefully, one of my assistants helping me right now, and we can play it. It's really fun. I love talking to my patient, uh, and uh, and we interview some of my older patients. I know I do look young, but I did practice for the last <laughs> ten years, and so I got some patients have become friends, um, and uh, they sometimes come and with doing connection, they text me with the baby pictures. And I actually invited them to my podcast about a couple months ago, but we haven't had time to air it. Um, and, um, and, and so 
it is amazing to uh, see, see you all. And yes, uh, some patients, uh, some of you are not patients, some of you are asking. Um, and I, I would like, um, yes, I am, sorry, I got lost track, I saw something about amazing. Uh, I am doing telemedicine, which means I'm doing doxymy. Uh, I was just explaining to a patient, uh, some of you worry about fertility insurance or no insurance. Or, um, I am, uh, insurance, uh, by the way, has changed rules because of COVID-19 since no patient are going to see doctors. And I'm a certified OBGYN express as well as Dr. Najat. We are seeing patients and most insurance are coupling uh, the telemedicine phone call and so forth. And even if it does not, uh, because of COVID-19, we are trying to help the community out. So we are giving complimentary if your insurance does not cover. So um, hopefully I will see some of you and have any questions, uh, come, and, um, come and talk to me. I'm in my little room here. <laughs> Sometimes you see, hear people screaming. That's my children. I try to make them do homework, but uh, between consults, but sometimes it may not work. Uh, I'm trying to make them do piano, but hey, doing my best. All of you, I know uh, moms or not yet moms or juggling between cooking and doing work and I'm doing the same. So I would love to talk to any of you who want to have a consultation with me or just talk to me. I'm always here. Uh, and uh, some days I'm still at the office doing essential visits and time sensitive visit. You see our website and all the information I'm talking, we try to upload right now onto the website. Um, and so you guys can reference it. If your friends want to hear from me, if they didn't catch it today, they can catch it uh, up uh, today. And again, for next week, um, I will do a little bit more activity and um, I will talk about diminished ovarian reserve because that's my passion. Uh, I haven't talked to you about genetics behind it, the origins behind it. Uh, we can talk more next week, um, but how to survive multiple failures or how to deal with multiple failures, uh, not only just IVF failures, but miscarriages. So we are also going to talk about miscarriages next week and and um, and I hope to see you then. Okay, it's a wrap up and I will talk to you next week, guys, Tuesday. And Hopefully we will continue our, uh, I don't know, this dialogue. I feel so interesting. I just talking, guys, listen to me. That has been my dream. Like I always ask my students, don't say anything and let me talk. <laughs> now you guys can just tag me with information. That's so cute. Oh, Dr. Nature's Instagram name? Hmm, I don't know. He's, I don't even know he like it. <laughs> I will find out. We will get it. Up to you. I, I think he's trying to still figure out Instagram, Facebook. Um, by the way, since I've guessed, I, I don't know. So one of my IT guy telling me I can do it on Zoom in and then do it on Facebook. But I thought most all of you guys are Facebook live. I, I don't know how to do this next week, but <laughs> we will figure out. But right now it's Instagram live. I see lots of like Instagram people are talking to each other. And they are all going live, so I thought we'll do Instagram live. And I know some of you may not have Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so get an Instagram account. I don't know. Instagram may be the future if COVID-19 will be here until 2002. Hi, guys. So happy. I see all these names popping up. Um, so I will, again, one, of, one more time, all these videos will be loading on my Facebook. And then I will, um, I, I will be um, covering... Cover PRP, cover PRP. Who's PRP? And next time, can you talk about statistics? Okay, yes, I can, I can. I will try to. I have some preliminary data uh, before we submit the abstract. Mm, maybe I should not present that to you yet. But um, we are also submitting abstract to American Society of Reproductive Medicine for the last three years, a generation next what we do. Oh, one more thing. I forgot. See, I'm rambling, but I remember. I am very interested how COVID-19 has affected us as a woman as an infertility patient, um, and I created a survey. Uh, my mom, actually, to share this, is, um, is a social worker, and I'm very interested in how sociology affects a patient, a her person thinking, and a patient thinking, and a pandemic can obviously affect all our thinking about life, about having a baby, about being, you know, just, we, I bet at home now, you're not going through your regular duties at home, you're gonna start thinking about how this has affected you as in a human, as in your family, 
and I want to know um, anxiety, uh, life quality. So I created a questionnaire and I'm going to send it through the listserv. It is totally anonymous. I've been trying everything I can to make sure it's anonymous because I don't really care who signed or whatever. It's really a population data I uh, want to know. And I'm going to send it out uh, tonight or tomorrow. Okay. And um, and that is something I would see what your feedback is and see if you're interested in doing it. Thank you. PRP, play with rich plasma. Yes. Yeah, so um, I am doing some work, and I know in Europe it's really the guy who did um, ovarian efficiency, like they re replace um, uh, the eggs supposedly they will draw the blood, clean up, spin it down the blood, and then infuse the platelet back into uh, like the, the I guess the serum because serum has blood in it, white blood cells. They spin it down and then they extract that and then put it back in a, a woman's ovary. Uh, data is not clean. So when you look at the data means, for example, I show you all lists of this FSH, right? All the FSH numbers, right guys? And this FSH number is from a patient um, throughout the whole year, right? So there's a fluctuation of her ovary. Each month is different. So how do I know that after you did the PRP, two months later, your ovary is doing great, is from that or from, from, from just time because it's fluctuating. Your FSH is 30, doesn't mean it's 30 next time, which we talked about. So I, there's no great data. And there's also like, it seems as acupuncture, say for supplements, how do we know it's timing of the ovary? and timing of, of responding. And this is where science and, and, and absolute data becomes hard. My thinking is, and Dr. Nature and I are thinking about it, but we, I, I need more data, sorry, before I would execute it in my office. I know there are offices who have done it, I know, guys, uh, because diminished ovarian reserve is something really important. I told you I, I love it. And so I, I, I know some of us have done PRP and I, I just need a little bit more data because I don't want to hurt a patient, right? Uh, Hippocratic oath is not to hurt a patient. Um, you're injecting some serum with the side effects to ovary can cause ovarian cancer. I'm, again, I'm not here uh, saying it will or anything because I, I'm telling you, I, there's limited information right now for me. Um, but I don't think it's a bad idea to present some papers. So I will try to get, I have a, a uh, patient who is a avid reader, she's did lots of research. She did it, the PRP herself, and she's my, uh, lots of you guys become my friend, and I mean, patient and friend, I guess not professional, but I, I guess the way I talk, and patients sometimes they feed me. I, some of my patients, some, <laughs> some of you guys will buy me lunch because they think I'm too skinny and so forth. So first of all, you guys are amazing, and that's why I have so much joy being a doctor every day. Uh, and when you guys also share me with literature, I'm learning every day. I'm learning a lot. Your ovaries taught me a lot. Sometimes I miss something. I'm like, huh, oh, you can do this. And all this data that I have is from you guys teaching me, even from Yale Medical School, even my brick and residency. I, I'm still learning every day because everyone is different when, with the presentation. So I, I, I look at some paper, maybe I would think about doing a presentation like this as we get um, maybe even after the next week, okay? I will talk about what are the out of the box care for DOR um, and a diminished ovarian reserve. Would that be fair, guys? Let me do a little bit more paper research on it and then I will give you my concrete opinion. But right now, my today's concrete opinion is that um, I don't know if it hurts. That's why we're not doing it yet in my office, but I don't see yet a, um, a significant clinical benefit yet. And so that's why I've been keeping my reservation. Um, is this, um, I know there's some study and done on three patients. I read the paper in Europe and how he did it. And I don't even know if everyone is doing the same way. So um, data is very, very important. And I would like to you know, present that in a more scientific manner. Sorry, being a scientist in me. It's hard. <laughs> thank you, thank you. 
Well, that's why we're here. If it's the same the box, you don't every, any IV. I always tell my patient when your FSH is low, your tubal defect, or you're 32, and you're trying to get pregnant. And when I stimulate you, I get eight normal embryos, which I do. And some of you guys who have the quote unquote easier cases, um, then you don't need outside the box. Wait, in the box, you will get pregnant no matter where you go. But when we are getting trickier, you want to, you know, IVF center A, you want to IVF center B, and coming to me, IVF center, you know, the third IVF center, that's when, um, that's when it is hard to say, you know, uh, hard to give you the inside the box care. Oh, I have one more question before I go. I'm wrapping things up, but here we are. How was the wound stage of treatment that was assessed, and what was the treatment mild natural? Natural meaning time to course. Okay. Um, the oldest patient we have that mine is actually um, delivered at 38, uh, sorry, 48. Um, she got pregnant at 47. Um, I actually forgot, 40, 40, yeah, 47. And she is um, was an embryo banking mild stimulation. She was still able to give me three or four eggs. We bank about four blastocysts. Um, and I was also her third IVF center. Um, but I don't want to use that as you mislead anyone who are on the social media or anything. Oh, doctors can get women 47-year-old pregnant or 48. I, I, I don't like that because there may be 10 46, 47-year-old come to me and I'm only able to do that for two of you. So that's two out of 10, which is pretty good. But at the same time, it's not everyone will have the success results. Um, it is a, um, she, and I can remember it. So this is not that I, I do get lots of women who are 40s uh, able to get pregnant with a untested embryo or so forth. So pregnancy rate is high. It's about 30%. If you came on uh, retrieval, I will get you. But I, life birth is what I think your question is. And I want to be honest with that. Pregnancy is not, I mean, making an embryo. We have a great lab and we're building a great lab. And so um, uh, it will be a, also a, you know, as, as we are going on to the next chapter, but it, it is a great lab and we can make embryos, uh, blastocysts for patients who are 45, 46, 47. Uh, but, that, but does not mean, uh, you know, everyone, wait, oh, send the page. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, am I still live? Oh, Cheryl. Cheryl. Oh, I'm still live. Okay. Sorry. I I couldn't see anything on my thing. I did something. Sorry, guys. In any case, I will um, talk to you next week. I will meet. Um, I'm trying to uh, do something special, but in terms of Facebook, we'll keep it at 1 p.m. Let's do that at 1 p.m. And so I'm coming. Uh, and then we will talk about our next step. Sorry, I'm, I'm asking my assistant. My assistant just texted me and said, yes, I'm still on. Um, and I will try to see different activity to do next week, um, some posts, but I will see you back next Tuesday, one o'clock. Okay, guys, one o'clock is still good. Thank you, guys, for all, you guys all helping me out. Um, and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay.